Good morning. Good morning. Okie doke. We have We have Scarlet and Violet, Eliza and Alexa. What what did I Ariana and Eliana, 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 and Alexa. And we have Isa and Owen and Jackson and Devlin? Declan. And help me, help me. What's your name? Matthew. Declan and Matthew. Declan and Matthew. Declan and Matthew. And my name is? Pastor Ramen, he's got Pastor it. Something. Pastor something. Yeah. I will not answer to that, just so you know. Wait. All right. So did you hear, did you, were you listening to the scripture lesson? Did you hear all the names of the different people? Yeah. Normally, if I'm giving one person that reading, I apologize to them in advance for all the names. So I got quiet because I wanted to hear how everybody was going to do pronouncing all the different, all the different people and and nationalities and languages. It says the disciples got together and they were all spoke the same language and suddenly they started speaking in different languages and Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, students, Cretans and Arabs in our own language. We heard them speaking about God's deeds of power. Do you want to know what I learned in seminary? It doesn't matter whether you pronounce them correctly. You just need to say it with confidence. I understood nothing. You understood none of, none of that? Okay. All... <laughs> yes, Owen? Uh, the people on the way? Yeah, they talk about the, Jesus is, is, they talk about the way of Jesus. So yeah, these are people on the way. Only you only understood one. All right, so really, really bright people sat down and they researched this list of all these different things. And do you know what's really interesting? They didn't all exist in the same time period. Right, all these different places. It's like this where we're where we are now wasn't always the United States. Right? Before that it was just colonies and before that, does anybody know I know where I live up in Sparta and it, it's the uh the Lenape tribe? No. What about here? Anybody know? No. Is it Lenape as well? So there were people here, so so eons, of, you know, ages and ages, years and years and years and years ago, before the United States existed, this would have been called Lenape territory. But then it changed. Yes. Lenape. You're learning about oh, awesome. Thank you. And you are yes. Um, and it's so funny because we have a school up by me, and they say Len- Lenape, but it's Lenape. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so um, there, I went, did you see me scoot out before? Because I was trying to find a book. All of a sudden it occurred to me, I have a book with all these maps that shows you how, how the names of places have changed over the years, right? And so I, I thought, oh, that would be great. I could show you that. But so we're just going to have to talk about it. But what's really cool in the idea of like all of these different languages in all of these different times that the way, Owen, of Jesus is for all people at all times, right? The folks back then and the folks today and the folks in the future, right? No matter what we call ourselves. I said no. You said no. No matter what we call ourselves, we could say that we're from the United States, we could say, you know, whatever, that the way of Jesus is for all people in all times. Does that make sense? Regardless of whether... No, no it doesn't make sense. Can okay. Can I restart? No. No. 
do you know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tag team with Mrs. Walsh, and I'll say, she's probably got a whole lesson plan. I know she has a whole lesson plan, but if you have any further questions, just ask Mrs. Walsh. <laughs> All right, can you do this? Let's see if we can follow this. Can you fold your hands, close your eyes, bow your heads, and I'll say a prayer for us. Gracious God, thank you for Jesus who speaks today yesterday and will speak tomorrow to our kids and our grandkids and their kids and their kids and their kids. We thank you that your message is eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from Romans chapter 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Holy Spirit was not born on Pentecost. The Holy Spirit became known on Pentecost. In the beginning, in the beginning, the breath of God swept over the face of the waters. Ruach in Hebrew means wind or breath or spirit. In, Hebrew, uh, in Greek, the word is pneuma, same thing, wind, breath, or spirit. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room, we read, he breathed on them and wished them peace. That's the, uh, the Johannine version of the Pentecost. A mighty wind brought life to dry bones in the Old Testament. Out of the wind, God spoke to Job. In Acts, we see the Spirit of God fill God's people, and the Spirit hasn't stopped filling God's people since then. I listened to a lectionary podcast this week, and one of the hosts shared that several years ago when they had talked about Pentecost, they received a letter from a a listener, and they had been saying, why does Pentecost get short shrift in the church? You know, Pentecost is like the middle child between Christmas and Easter, You know, Christmas is huge, Easter is huge. Why not Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit? And this listener, also a pastor, wrote this. He, uh, or, and I'm going to paraphrase. He's, uh, he said that Easter and Christmas are received as gifts, and all we have to do is be thankful. But for Pentecost, we are asked to share our stories, to witness, and we're less excited about that because. We're confronted with our own reluctance to do just that. Your missions committee, or in this church you call it ACT, asked that we have a Sunday highlighting missions and specifically missionaries. So these are folks who have committed their lives to sharing their faith. When I was in seminary, I looked into being a missionary sponsored by the Presbyterian Church USA, and one of the reps was on, on campus and was having interviews, and I sat with him, and he said, well, what is your special skill? <laughs> you mean besides I love Jesus? You know, uh, I said, I, I, I speak Spanish. And he said, well, he's like, modern-day missionaries uh, usually very often have a, have a skill set. And the two missionaries that you sponsor through the Presbyterian Church exemplify this. There's Elizabeth and Dan who serve in Madagascar. Elizabeth works with with the health department's rural dispensaries, and Dan teaches courses in agriculture and environmental issues. So it's practical and spiritual at the same time. You also sponsor a missionary in Vienna, Ken, who you just heard, who grew up in this church. And you sponsor a missionary, Mary Woodward, in Spain, who supports church and parachurch organizations, church planting, discipling, and mercy ministries. We used to think of missionaries only as people who would travel abroad and share their faith. 
But now we understand that we can have missionaries also in our own communities. We can't assume that any, anyone or everyone has had a church experience anymore or growing up. The challenge, and I know I've shared this, is that in, I had a friend who was on a, on a webinar talking about our mission field in the United States. And the presenter said, we need to assume at this point that everyone may not have had their own church experience, but they know of someone who has, and they, everyone knows someone who has had a bad church experience. A few years ago, I watched a, a season of Queer Eye on Netflix, which is a, a, a group of gay men who come and help you, you know, dress better. They redo your, your, your digs. They work on your relationships, all, all this different stuff. Oh, grooming. Mm. And one of, the, one of the, the team, Bobby, grew up in the church. And his family lived ate and breathed church, like my family did growing up. There was always somebody at the church's building. Wednesday night was junior choir. Thursday night was senior choir. Uh, there was youth group. There was women's group. One of my parents was either a deacon or elder. There was always somebody at the church, and that's a type of his, of his experience growing up until he came out. And then his family kicked him out, and he was homeless and slept on friends' couches for many years. And, and now, you know, Anyway, this whole episode was this woman who wanted to redo the fellowship hall at her church for this mission idea that she had. And we watched as Bobby, who swore he would never, ever enter a sanctuary of a, of a church ever again. And this woman's son was also gay. And she said she had struggled with that and had come to understand that her job was just to love him. And we watched her love on Bobby, and we watched healing happen. Now, I do not think Bobby is singing in any church choir. But we got to see some healing happen. We got to see a church doing wonderful things, and we got to see a church filled with flawed people trying to do their very best. That's our mission field in this country where Christians have a reputation of being judgmental and hypocritical, and we can be. And maybe that's one of the re reasons that we're reticent to share our faith or embrace our calling to be witnesses to our faith in God because we're aware of our own hypocrisy. And, and it's true, we're all hypocrites. But remember, and this is the only way you can do it, we're not pointing to ourselves. We're not saying, hey, look at me, I've got it all together. We're pointing to Jesus and saying, you know, I get out of bed in the morning because of my faith in Jesus Christ. And during COVID, my gosh, I, the only reason I got out of bed in the morning is because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus, I know hope. In Jesus, I know peace. In Jesus, I know love, unconditional love. I would encourage you to figure out, like if somebody were to ask you, just to wrestle with this, if somebody said, why, why do you believe in Jesus? Three sentences. What would your answer be? Or you could, like Apostle Paul, the, one of the things I also appreciate, it, Apostle Paul says, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. That's one way too. But I would encourage you to think about that. I've been amazed at somebody who comes to me later that you, I want you to know that you said this thing and it, it changed my life. And you're like, I didn't think about that thing at all. And it wasn't in a sermon. It was like some comment on the side. And you're like, no way. Holy Spirit. Recently, somebody said something and something came out of my mouth and I hadn't thought about it at all. And I was like, dang, that was good. <laughs> and I told Holy Spirit, you're like, that's good. And I mean, Holy Spirit is alive and well and, and continues to show up. And sometimes, and this is when you feel the Spirit just prompting you, say something, say something, say something, or you're in a situation where it's, you're like, is no one going to say something? And you're looking around, is no one going to say something? And uh, then that's when you say a prayer, Holy Spirit, help. 
Give me the words. Or, are you sure? Yeah. You also support missionaries working in the United States. With an emphasis on college campuses, you support three people who work with InterVarsity, Joanne and Janet and Kathy, and two people, Michael and Lisa, who work with Crew or Campus Crusade for Christ and their program called Athletes, Athletes in Action. You also support the work of Twyla, who works with Child Evangelism Fellowship of North Jersey, partnering with local churches to sponsor after-school programs. And you sponsor and volunteer with Family Promise, which is a housing ministry for, for homeless folks, and Mesh, which gives not only the gift of food, but relationship, to be known, to know people's names, to look them in the eye, to, to honor people's, you know, too often with folks who are on the streets, we avoid eye, eye contact, and here they can come to a place and have somebody look at them and acknowledge their humanity. And for all the Mesh and volunteers, that is you know, such a gift that you give to people to be seen. And we get to be part of that. Our goal as missionaries is not to prove other religions wrong. We are simply called to witness our experience of God. My children ask me, Mom, what about all the other religions? And my answer... <laughs> I experienced the Holy Spirit in the Church of Jesus Christ, and I haven't felt the need to look elsewhere. Again, our job is not to convince people or to these theological arguments. Our job is to witness to our experience of faith in Jesus Christ that offers hope and joy and peace and love to each of us and to this world. If we experience faith as a gift, then we will offer it as a gift. We are blessed to live in a land where we can share our faith with one another and not be persecuted. Norma reminds me, and, and she has told me about a daily devotion, and I looked it up, called Open Doors, that shares the stories of people who are persecuted for their faith. And we need to be mindful of them and mindful that you know, to not be persecutors of others who believe differently than we do. I find, and let's, you know, let's make this a little more complex, I find it challenging. I find it especially challenging with religions and faith traditions that do not consider women equal. But then I look at our history, and I look at other Christian denominations, and I think we have not arrived. And our house is made of glass. There's a lot of work to do. Our call is to share honestly and authentically the different faith in Jesus has meant in our lives. The disciples spoke in different languages, different tongues. When, you're, when you share your faith, you will be, you, your voice is unique to you, your story, your language, your history, your authentic witness. When we share our faith, the Spirit can breathe life into our words. I hope you are blessed with many Holy Spirit moments and then share those stories with others, lots of them. When you stand back in awe at how God showed up, and, you know, and then all you can do is just hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God. God is, God is with us in power and spirit in the world and can speak through you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.